headaches, we all get them, but very few of us ever experience the oftentimes debilitating pain of cluster headaches. In today's podcast, we'll be learning about cluster headache, one entity within the group known as the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. We are very fortunate to have with us two distinguished best doctors experts, Dr. David Dodick, professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, and Dr. Larry Newman, professor of neurology at Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Let's dive right into it. I'll start by asking uh, Dr. Newman, what are the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias? Unlike migraines, which affect about 36 million Americans, the, the, the prototypical trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia is cluster headache, and that's fairly uncommon. It affects only about half of 1% of the country. So these are uncommon headache disorders, but they're important for the, for the doctor to know about because they cause severe suffering. And in fact, most people who have them can go years and years, up to five years or so, before they're correctly diagnosed. So definitely, the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias aren't entities that we're going to be seeing every day. So we really need to be able to understand what to look for. What do you think, are, or what would you say are the attack, frequency, characteristic differences that distinguish cluster headaches from other trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias? That's a great question. So the prototypical trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia is cluster headache. And that's characterized by headaches that occur with a frequency of anywhere from once every other day up to eight times per day, typically at the same time every day and often in the middle of the night awakening the patient from a sound sleep. The headaches are, are intense and, and excruciatingly severe, typically centered in and around the eye, behind the eye, with radiation into the temple on that side or into the teeth. And not surprisingly, because of that pattern, many people who have it are mistakenly diagnosed or misdiagnosed as having dental issues or sinus issues. Cluster headache lasts anywhere from 15 to 180 minutes each. And during the attack, on the side of the pain, at least one of the following ipsilateral features are seen. Um, ptosis, so the eyelid droops, lacrimation, the eye tears, the pupil becomes smaller, the nostril stuffs or starts to run, and the activity of what the patients do distinguish it from migraine and some of the other tacks. So patients with cluster are exceedingly restless, and in fact, that can be used as a diagnostic, part of the diagnostic criteria. They pace about, they, they throw themselves from side to side, they sit in a chair holding their eye, rocking back and forth. So that's the prototypical tack, but others include the paroxysmal hemicranias and hemicrania continua and the sunk syndrome. Paroxysmal hemicrania is similar to, to cluster in the, in the location of the pain and the quality of pain, the difference is the frequency of the attack. So if cluster occurs once to every other day to eight times a day, the paroxysmal hemicranias occur 10, 15, even 20 times a day, and the attacks are much shorter, only about 20 to 30 minutes each. The sunk syndrome is the rarest of all of the attacks, and it has attacks that can occur hundreds of times a day because each attack, each individual attack, lasts anywhere from one to 600 seconds each. So these are seconds, the others are minutes to hours. And then the newest entry to this category is a headache disorder called hemicrania continua. That is, does not consist of individual brief attacks, but rather a constant one-sided headache that's always there, what we call the baseline pain. And then superimposed upon this one-side baseline pain, patients will get ex exacerbations of more severe pain. Once a week, once a month, whatever their pattern is, with these painful exacerbations lasting anywhere from a few minutes to several days. But when the pain flares up, those same cranial autonomic symptoms that I'd mentioned about with the other headaches occur. When the attack goes away, the autonomic features go away, but rather than being pain-free, like with sunk syndrome or cluster of the paroxysmal hemicranias, those sufferers of hemicrania continua have a low-level pain that persists all the time. That's excellent. That makes a lot of sense, but also is a lot to remember, especially for uh, someone like myself, where where my motto is uh, "keep it simple, stupid." So, you know, why is it important, or is it important, to distinguish between these um, various trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias? 
So on the surface, you wouldn't think it really matters which one of those tacks that the patient is suffering from because it's a tack. But in fact, it's very important because the treatment responses are significantly different from one to the other. So those drugs that work for cluster don't work for sunk. Those that work for sunk don't work for hemicrania continua or the paroxysmal hemicrania. So if you don't make the right diagnosis, there's no way of starting the correct treatment. Well, that's a great question. And the reason why it's important to distinguish between the different types of primary headache syndromes that comprise the tax is because they each have different treatment approaches. So if you make the wrong diagnosis, you're going to be led down the wrong path. You'll expose patients to treatments that are likely to be ineffective and to the side effects and potential toxicity associated with the treatments um, that you expose that patient to. So to get the treatment right, you need the right diagnosis because they're each approached differently. Having a sense of, uh, of the different uh, symptoms that would present, here I am, primary care internist, go into the office and see my patient, 55-year-old man, feeling miserable, clutching his head, pacing around the room, complaining of, of eye redness, tearing, rhinorrhea. So I feel pretty confident about the diagnosis of cluster headaches. What kind of evaluation, if any, is indicated? Or is um, having the, the typical characteristics enough to establish a diagnosis and move ahead to treatment? Well, most of the time when patients present with what clinically appears to be cluster or one of these other tacks, um, it's unlikely that they're caused by a secondary, by an intracranial lesion or by some other uh, mimic. On the other hand, there are plenty of patients that we've seen in practice as well as those that have been described in the literature where you look at the patient, you listen to the patient, it sounds like they have classic cluster or chronic paroxysmal hemicrania and yet they may harbor an intracranial lesion or a vascular anomaly that may account for the diagnosis. For example, I've seen two patients this year with what looked like cluster headache but who actually had carotid artery dissection. And we've certainly seen a number of these tacks, particularly sunk syndrome, but also <clears throat> some of the other tacks where they may be caused by a pituitary lesion or a lesion that uh, borders the pituitary gland. And so oftentimes it, with a pituitary lesion, for example, they can be clinically silent. In other words, they don't lead to any neurological symptoms or any uh, abnormal neurological signs on examination, but yet they still might give rise to one of these tacks. So I think uh, while, while we probably over-image the majority of patients with primary headache disorders that present to us, these are rare enough and have enough mimics that I think doing it at an imaging procedure at least once uh, when you first see these patients, particularly an MRI scan, and particularly an MRI that allows you to get a good look at the pituitary gland, I think is reasonable. And in patients who present to you for the first time with no prior history of cluster headache or CPH or sunk syndrome, um, one wants to be careful not to overlook an arterial cause. So for the very reason I said the last two, pa two of the patients I've seen this year have had carotid artery dissection, I'll usually check an MRA of their head and neck as well. And once that's, once that's done, and you can be confident they don't have a, a mimic, if you will, then you can get to the business of treating that patient. As we discuss the business of treatment, uh, again, uh, thinking to uh, boards review courses, um, uh, remember the role of, of, of treatment entities like oxygen, calcium channel blockers, prednisone. I'm wondering, uh, with, with a focus on cluster headaches, how would you approach treatment? The, the treatment of cluster headache tends to be three-pronged. We have acute therapies, meaning those agents that are taken to stop the individual attack, the acute attack. We have preventive therapies, those, those agents that are used to shorten the cycle of cluster headache. And then we'll, we have what what's called bridge therapy, something that we do, either a medication or a procedure like a nerve block, to stop the, the attacks relatively quickly until the preventive agent has a chance to kick in. For the acute therapy, assuming there's no contraindications, the drug of choice would be, for most of us, would be the injectable form of sumatriptan. And, and injection, injections of sumatriptan come two ways, as a 4 milligram and as a 6, six milligram injection. Depending on the frequency of the headaches, most of us would use the 4 milligram because if there's a 12 milligram a day maximum, you can take three injections of the 4 milligram versus only two of the 6 milligram. 
The drug of choice also for prevention tends to be verapamil, but it, the dose can be quite large, anywhere from 240 milligrams to 720, sometimes even more than that. And while most of us would start with the long-acting medication because of patient compliance, there's good evidence that the short-acting formulation uh, of verapamil tends to be better better in some patients. So even if someone hasn't responded to the 240 milligram long acting, often what many of us would do would be giving them 80 milligrams three times a day, so the same dose, but in, in multiple dosages, and, and you can get results then. But since the prevention takes about 10 to 14 days to work, you need to give the patient some respite from this awful pain. And we would most of us would use, assuming no contraindications, a taper of prednisone, so 60 to 80 milligrams per day, gradually decreasing over 14 to 21 days, so that as the prednisone, which should work within 24, 36 hours, is being weaned down, the verapamil has a chance to kick in. Another alternative, which, which is very useful, can be an occipital nerve block, a combination of long and short-acting lidocaine and steroids can actually shorten the attacks as well. I agree completely with what Dr. Newman said. I guess for those patients who are needle phobic and would rather not inject themselves, sometimes 100% oxygen at 7 to 15 liters a minute can be a very effective. Obviously not as convenient because it's hard to drag your oxygen canister and have your mask available uh, at work or at the movie theater or wherever else you might be. So it's not terribly convenient, but for home use it can be effective, particularly for people who can't take um, the injectable sumatriptan or who may have contraindications to its use or can't tolerate it. Uh, and then sometimes for patients who are needle phobic and for whom oxygen doesn't really work, we'll sometimes use intranasal sumatriptan um, or intranasal Zolmig actually. Uh, both are uh, more rapidly acting usually than the tablets, not quite as fast as the injection, but sometimes patients will prefer to do that rather than inject themselves. Um, other than that, I think, you know, everything Dr. Newman said is absolutely the, the way that most of us would approach the, the, the new patient with cluster headache. So, you know, certainly I feel prepared as a, as a primary care physician to evaluate uh, and treat um, uh, cluster headaches. If, I, if there is something that appears to be a different tack, for example, hemicrania continua, what would be some of the, um, uh, the principles of, of treatment there? Well, hemicrania continua and the paroxysmal hemicranias fall under the category of indomethacin responsive headache disorders. They're disorders that are uniquely responsive to treatment with indomethacin and in general only indomethacin. The, the drugs that we use for Sunk syndrome, the drugs that we just discussed for cluster headache won't work for those, those other patients. And, and that actually is, is very interesting to me. Um, I often just think of NSAIDs as NSAIDs. Do people, uh, does anyone understand what the properties of endomethacin might be that enable it to be so effective in these uh, syndromes? Well, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's been a curiosity about that drug um, ever since endomethacin was described as being so uniquely uh, effective for some of these syndromes. It turns out that you know, the, per the what we call the cranial parasympathetic pathway or parasympathetic nerves that come out of the brainstem that actually innervate the nasal mucosa and the lacrimal gland and indeed the uh, intracranial circulation um, are innervated by these parasympathetic fibers. And what's unique about that pathway is not only are they, is that pathway activated in chronic paroxysmal hemicrania, cluster and sunct, um, but you know, these syndromes tend to be responsive to endomethacin with perhaps the exception of cluster headache, but sometimes I think even patients with cluster can respond. So the idea that some of us had a long time ago is that maybe endomethacin is doing something within this cranial parasympathetic pathway other than just inhibiting cyclooxygenase. And indeed, it does appear that endomethacin may be able to inhibit the production of or the release of something called nitric oxide. So there are as many, many, many of us know about nitric oxide, it's a ubiquitous neurotransmitter, it's a gas actually um, throughout the brain, throughout the nervous system, but uh, there are nitric oxide producing neurons within this cranial parasympathetic pathway and endomethacin appears to have a unique effect on inhibiting the production of nitric oxide and thereby inhibiting the cranial parasympathetic uh, 
outflow to the lacrimal gland, the nasal mucosa, and other structures that that that, that pathway innervates. So, indomethacin, as opposed to many other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, appears to be working through other pathways, and that probably explains why other COX-1, COX-2, or dual COX inhibitors aren't nearly as effective. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Newman, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I'd agree with, with, doc, with what Dr. Dodick said. It's interesting also, and Dr. Dodick has patients, as, as do I, with this, who just can't take indomethacin. And it's interesting for those patients who have GI upset or kidney problems who can't take indomethacin, often switching them to melatonin, which has a chemical structure similar to indomethacin, will actually work in the, sa in, in the same way and, and decrease the headache frequency and severity. Fascinating. Well, uh, again, thank, uh, thank you very much to both of you for a dynamic, engaging discussion of, uh, of a, a group of headache entities, the tax that uh, can often be bewildering to non-neurologists, and, uh, and you've made it very clear. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Best Doctors needs neurologists and headache specialists to consult on challenging cases. We offer honoraria and CME credit for participating. If you are an elected Best Doctors expert and would like information on giving virtual second opinions with Best Doctors, visit bestdoctors.com consult, email us at physicians at bestdoctors.com, or call 855-361-3800.